Sunday of June. Please join us in our, uh, in our virtual worship service. Wherever you are, stand, praise God, and just let us sing together.
with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with the joy that you bring, joy that you bring. worship. Please join me in the call to worship, which will be on the screen. All right, we will get back to the call to worship. Let us sing leader. Okay. Well, my <laughs> friends, you know, technology is so fun. Please join me in the call to worship. Welcome, friends, to this holy day. We, we come, come to, to offer, offer thanks. thanks. We, we come, come to sing and, and pray. pray. Welcome, friends, to this time set apart. A time to remember the holy promises of God. Welcome, friends to this table of remembrance and joy. The table where we are fed, the feast we share with many. Welcome, friends, and let us worship God. Please join me in our next song, King of Glory. Pursues me with his love and haunts me with each hearing of his softly spoken words. My conscience, a reminder of forgiveness that I need. Who is this King of Glory? offers it to me.
King of glory. Thank you, praise team, and good morning and welcome to our online worship service. My name is Matt Hadley, and I'm the senior pastor here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay. And what a privilege it is to be able to worship with you, albeit virtually. This has been a difficult week, a week of protest, uh, a week of dis-ease, and we are going to hit that head-on throughout our entire service this week. But before we hear a word from our bishop, Bishop He Su Young, we need to take care of a little bit of business. You'll notice on your screen there is a different telephone number for you to share your joys and your concerns this week. And so if you have something on your heart that you want this community of faith, your community of faith, to be holding together in prayer, please text those into that new number. From 11.30 to 1 o'clock today, we are again going to be offering our walk-up communion. We have these self-contained kits with a wafer on top of the cup of blessing. And we just ask that when you come, you, you do uh, Face yourselves out. We have places designated along the sidewalk that are seven feet apart. Um, if you came with somebody in the same car, you guys can stand together. But come forward. I will have my mask. I will have uh, some gloves. So the only person who's actually going to be touching uh, the communion kit would be you. Tomorrow night at 6.30, uh, we will continue with our Monday night sermon talk back from 6.30 to 7.30. The information and the link is on our webpage, umcwfb.org. And we are still prayerfully uh, considering launching, reopening our doors for a live worship, albeit in a smaller scale and, and a little bit differently on June 21st. Our team that has been doing the strategic thinking has developed a worship covenant that is going to be presented before our accountable leadership board this Tuesday, and it will be posted on our website and on the front doors as well. But as United Methodists here in the state of Wisconsin, we looked for a word from our leader. And so this week, Bishop Jung put out the following letter, and I'd like to read it for you as we begin our worship service this day. Good people of Jesus Christ, it is time for us to acknowledge and confront our racism and the systems and structures we have created that continue to perpetuate injustice, inequality, and violence. It is not enough for each individual to say, my heart breaks for the families of violence uh, against brown, black, and Asian people. This is a starting point, but it does nothing to bring about change. When we do this, we become God's dedicated ones who are deaf and blind. I could say that recent events have raised our awareness, but the recent incidents with Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor are just the most recent in decades and centuries in this country. The pandemic has taken an inordinate toll on black and brown communities because our systems foster continued poverty and marginalization of racial ethnic minorities. We cannot simply voice regret and concern. The time has come for the United Methodist Church to work together for justice for our black family members, for all children of God. Black Lives Matter became a slogan that those people used to voice their anger, hurt, and displeasure. No, the truth of Black Lives Matter emerged because story after story, incident after incident, showed that it is not safe to be a black person in our 21st century reality. No one should have to worry that they will be stopped due to the color of his or her skin. No one should worry that they will be beaten, attacked, or killed because they fit a profile. Young black people should not have to be told not to run, not to make eye contact, not to approach white people, and their parents should not have to live in fear whenever their children leave home. This is not the will of God. This is not acceptable to people who have been baptized into the spiritual community committed to building God's holy realm on earth. We need to work for justice. We need to crusade for peace. 
We need to speak up, speak out, and stand with our black brothers and sisters. We need to embrace our brown brothers and sisters as members of our family. We need to reassure our Asian siblings that they belong. We need to welcome those of every hue and color as acceptable, beloved, gifted, and blessed. This cannot simply be a nice concept and a good intention. The day has come to commit our mission work to the peace and justice work of our general board of church and society. It is now time to communicate to our state and federal leaders that racial justice is our highest need, our highest priority. We must divorce racial justice from a misguided sense that this is a political issue and that we should not be involved. This is a human rights issue. Moreover, it is a Christian witness for the world. We must open ourselves to be the prophetic voice of God, to allow God's message of mercy, justice, humility, peace, and unity to be heard loud and clear. In this time of pandemic anxiety, We should do nothing to contribute to people's pain and suffering, but should do all in our power to offer healing and hope. If you cannot walk in peaceful protest, you can still write letters, make phone calls, send emails, and vote. When possible, we should rally around our ethnic communities and work to clean up, restore, and rebuild in solidarity and in partnership. It is time to make our heartfelt passion concrete. We are not called to sit by and watch God's children be abused and killed. The time has come for revolutionary change. Our core values as Christians include the affirmation of all life, the glory and goodness of God's creation, and the very real truth that God is love. As we live into our future, we will transcend our vision to confront institutional racism so that together we might eliminate not only the outward and visible signs, but might allow the healing spirit of God to transform the inward and spiritual sickness. Grace and peace, signed Bishop Hisu Jung. When I was laying out the sermon series, Encountering Jesus. Today's message was set aside to be encountering Jesus in a sermon. What I had planned to say later in the service has been changed. It has been altered. It's still going to be a sermon, and it's still my prayer that we will encounter not only Jesus, but his claim upon our lives if we truly are Christ followers. Thank you. And so now we transition into a video for our children that Miss Christie has put together. Good morning. Today, we're learning about encountering Jesus in a sermon. Jesus was a teacher. He was a preacher. He gave us a very important message. He told us to love our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Right now, we have neighbors who are hurt, scared, sad, frustrated, and angry. How do we show our neighbors love? How do we do what Jesus asked us to do? Some of my friends gave us their answer. Let's listen and see what they have to say. One way we can show our love to our neighbors that are hurting is to steal all the food. Good. Can you put it in the bag, please? Over the past couple weeks, I've been making lots of muffins and sharing them with my 
friends, family, and neighbors. So we heard that nursing homes aren't allowing visitors in because of COVID-19. So some of the residents are feeling sad and lonely. So we made hearts that told them positive messages to make them feel better. So now it's your turn. How are you going to show your neighbors love? There's a lot of ways to show love. Talk about it with your family. I love you. I'll see you soon. Well, thank you very much, Miss Christie, for that incredible message. And thanks again to our young ones who are learning lessons that I hope will stay with them forever that there might be transformation here in the village of Whitefish Bay, in the city of Milwaukee, and indeed the cities all around the world. You see, all the cities have the same God. And it's my prayer that as we sing this song, you're the God of this city, that we really mean it, that the reign of God, the love, the peace, the grace, eyes that see the marginalized will indeed be moved to action. You're the God of this city. invite you at home to open yourselves up to be centered and yet wide open as we approach our God in a time of silent and listening prayer let us be still before our God please dear Lord watch over all of us in this listening and learning time 
Please teach us all how to set your example to our children. They are watching. Prayers for my uncle struggling with mental health issues and a prayer of strength for those speaking out against racism and injustice. Please protect them from senseless and brutal violence and be with them as they march for justice and peace. Prayer of healing for Elsa and her family. Prayers for strength and hope for Bruce Thompson. May my sister Alice feel God's comfort as she struggles to care for her dwindling husband. A prayer of great thanks for recovery from COVID-19 and return to health for Arthur and Lear Gaffney. Prayers for those, including myself, with struggles and sadness, being out of work and in isolation. Prayers for our fractured community and nation, Prayers for those alone and suffering. May we pray for love and peace for each other and all of our communities. Prayers for my Uncle Greg and Aunt Kathy for hope in my uncle's batter, battle with can brain cancer. Safety for my cousin Vicki and her friends as they march in pe peaceful protests in Greensboro and for all our fellow Americans standing up for change in our country. Please pray for Jennifer in the hospital, Lynn Raffensperger going through treatment, Bruce Thompson going through treatment, and for the recovery of Marilyn Stanley. These are the prayers of our people. Almighty God, throughout history, there have been people who stood up for your son, Jesus. Empower us that we may stand up for Jesus in our time, especially this challenging time. Help us to stand up to be faithful, to be prayerful, to be loving, to proclaim Christ's lordship, his love and his grace. Help us to value one another's life and sacred worth, to respect each other regardless of our differences or culture or ethnicity. Help us to stand for love, justice, peace, nonviolence, and the common good of all people. Help us, empower us to do good, to do no harm, and to stand up for Jesus in the name of love. And so, merciful God, may your name be praised and honored among all people. We pray for your Holy Spirit to lead us, to lead our leaders and our communities across the country, and to teach us how to truly love one another. Empower us to stand up to stand up for your peace, your justice, your mercy, to stand up for all in this challenging time. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so we come now to a time of offering. And again, I want to extend thanks to all of you who are continuing to uh, financially support your community of faith that our mission and ministry might not miss a beat. And so as we are exploring the ways in which we can offer our own lives, I invite you to receive this musical offering.
And so thanks to the youngest of the Karth for sharing their God-given talents to the worship experience of our entire community. And so Almighty God, we ask that you would bless all the ways in which we share with you and share with the world our time, our treasure, and our talent. Bless it, Almighty God. In the name of Christ, we ask this. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask that if you have just tuned in to this live stream now that that you really find some time later today or in the week to go back to the beginning of this service so that you may as well hear the letter from our Bishop of the Wisconsin Annual Conference. But as we begin the message today, I want to share with you three scripture lessons. And the first is from a letter that Paul wrote to these Christians in Rome. He says this in the 10th chapter, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek because the same Lord is the Lord of all. The same Lord is the Lord of all who gives richly to all who call on him. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So how can they call on someone if they don't have faith in? How can they have faith in someone they haven't heard of? And how can they hear without a preacher and how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who announce good news. Our second text is from a second letter written to a young man named Timothy, a young pastor. And Paul says this, Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires 
and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and faithfully carry out the ministry that God has given to you. And our final lesson is a very short verse from Jesus Christ himself, a very popular verse. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. One of my favorite translations says simply, treat people in the same way that you want them to treat you. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, when we read our Bibles, when we look at the Gospels, we see that scriptures acknowledge the sinfulness of our human hearts, our tendency to deny the image of God in other people, our unwillingness to follow the commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves. The great preacher Harry Emerson Fosdick believed that all sermons should address real questions, real problems that the people are struggling with, that they are wrestling with. He says, any sermon which thus does tackle a real problem, throw even a little light on it and help some individuals practically to find their way through it cannot be altogether uninteresting. He would argue that such sermons lead people to transformation and empowers them into action. Brothers and sisters, I, I stand before you this morning to let you know that we have a real problem right now. There are questions that we need to wrestle with, that we need to attempt to answer. I focus on just two questions today. The first being, are we so broken? Are we so fractured that we are beyond repair? And secondly, as people of God, what are the matters of faith that we must tend to so that healing might take place? Now, there is no way I can put into words anything to definitively solve this right here this morning. No words. In fact, no one person can. It needs to be a collective effort. I was heartened to read this week. We need to start learning about others. When we don't know about other people, we withdraw and are afraid. We need to start being the body of Christ with all members functioning in their roles as one in the body. Another one said, the word is intentional. We need to be intentional most of us have the inclination to be intentional. We need to find the way or the time to do it. And one final said, we need to be willing to be comfortable with not being comfortable. Do you know where I found those words? Do you know where those words came from? They came from you. They came from you three and a half years ago. We had the Zeidler group come out here and we had a conversation about race within this community of faith. And I want you to know that we are revisiting the work that we have done, repenting how, for our lack of progress. I don't have the answers. I'm not even sure I have all of the right questions. Does anybody? But I want to. I need to dialogue about it. I have shared a number of times my favorite quote about a sermon. Perhaps a sermon should be regarded as great, not because everyone in the congregation agrees with the preacher, but because at the end of the service, those present, whether you're here in the sanctuary or at home with your family, that those present just can't wait to talk about it, to discuss it, and to debate it together. What makes a sermon great are the listeners. The listeners, the role of the listener goes a long way in determining whether or not they will encounter Jesus in the sermon, in the preaching moment. It goes a long way to determine if they are going to actually be moved to action, to do something. An illustration came to me as I was thinking this week about a, 
maybe a college freshman or a sophomore who, who fails a general education course early on in college. It, it happens. And sometimes they blame the professor's teaching or they say it was too difficult of a subject, but more likely, more likely that individual failed because they just weren't interested or maybe they'd say, I just wasn't ready to learn. I didn't put in the effort. I share that illustration because I want you. I need you this day to be interested, to put in the effort today because we need to wrestle with matters of faith, not only in the midst of a pandemic, but also in the fact that we as a nation are infected with growing racial tension and mounting violence. And so today, in order to answer our two questions, we need to look at justice. We need to look at racism. We need to look at violence. And we need to look at hope. All four of those are matters of faith. And it is my prayer that in doing so, we will encounter Jesus and feel the call to move. So the very first thing that I want us to look at is justice. The killings of Ahmaud Arbery by two white men, George Floyd under the knee of a white police officer, and others stand in a long line of similar killings, most of which go unnoticed outside of their communities. In this week's edition of the Christian Century, I I read uh, something that Dorothy Sanders Wells wrote. She is an African-American pastor serving a church in Tennessee. And in her article, she said this, there seems to be some inherent dangers to living life as a person of color in the United States. Perhaps those dangers have their origin in the days when it was legal for black people to be disciplined, to be lynched, reminded that that we occupy a lower place in society, she she wrote. Friends, our country has a history of a justice system that has had and does have in it systematic injustice. Think about our history. Think about manifest destiny and the outright abuse of this land's indigenous persons. Think about the fact that for a long time women were refused the right to vote. Think about during World War II that we, our officers, our officials, our military, rounded up U.S. citizens and residents of Asian descent, moving them into camps during World War II. Think about the civil rights movement of the 60s where dogs were turned on protesters all in the name of law and order. Over the years we have learned that laws can't end the danger of living life as a person of color in our country. For all 400 years this land has been inhabited by people of European descent and people of color alike. Faithful people have tried to justify separation and segregation. Law and order and justice are not always the same thing. A system of laws does not guarantee that justice will always be served. We need to be vigilant that we hold accountable, that we enforce the system where we can, that it will serve the cause of justice because we know that justice is not always served There are too many times in our country where guilty people are declared innocent and innocent people are incarcerated for something that they never, ever did, a crime they did not commit. Dr. King lets us know that peace is not the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. And that is God's word to us, to all of us, to seek justice for all people. The prophet said long ago, what does the Lord require? We remember this passage. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. Do, love, walk, justice, mercy, humility, and yet we don't get it. That's as old as humanity. 
in Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, Jesus is talking with the people of power, the people who had all the power within that Jewish nation. And he said to them, you know the law, but you ignore justice and the love of God. The United Methodist Church has a social creed, and we say we denounce as immoral an ordering of life that perpetuates injustice Working for justice is God's given task to us. And we need to remember that injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. And so when I look at justice, I see and I call that we need to work for justice by standing up for what is right, peacefully denouncing that which is unjust. But the second matter of faith we need to wrestle with, as uncomfortable as it may make us, is racism. Racism. While this COVID-19 pandemic is something none of us have seen before in our lifetime, sadly, racism and racial tension is something that we have all seen and seen too often. Depending of your age, you may be thinking to yourself, here we go again. Why can't we figure this out? But friends, the truth is, Really, any person of any color in any country in the world is capable of racism. There is a generational reality to racism. Racism is taught. It is a learned behavior. You know, the Bible talks about sins being passed down through the generations, and that makes many of us very uncomfortable. Why would God allow these sins to be passed down from generation to generation? Friends, racism is a sin, a sin. And unfortunately, if you grew up in a racist home, you will be racist. Unless, unless that is, you are willing to be the generation that breaks that curse. Part of this recent tension is because there are systems in place that are simply weighted heavily against people of color. Racism is alive in the United States of America, always has been, and racism is completely antithetical. It is in direct opposition to the Christian gospel. If we look at what the United Methodist Church says, we say the United Methodist Church recognizes that the sin of racism has been destructive to its unity throughout its history. Racism continues to cause painful division and marginalization the United Methodist Church shall confront and seek to eliminate racism, whether in organizations or in individuals, in every facet of its life and in society at large. The United Methodist Church shall work collaboratively with others to address concerns that threaten the cause of racial justice at all times and in all places. That's our stance, but do we do it at all times and in all places? Are we able to see the other as equal? Do we see their children as our children? There's a cold hard fact that even the least racist is still racist. And so when we think about this racism, the call to you this day is to abolish racism by focusing on equality. To stop focusing on how we're different, but to focus on our sameness. But the third thing, the third matter of faith, in addition to justice and racism, is all the violence, the violence that we have been seeing. One of the blessings of our technology here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay and our decision to broadcast Sunday services live instead of pre-recording and, and putting it together earlier in the week one of the blessings is that we get to respond to things that happened yesterday or something that happened just this morning. I was in my office here, my car parked right out in front on Silver Spring, and yesterday at about 1.45, hundreds and hundreds of protesters walked right down the middle of Silver Spring. These protesters were young and old. They were black, white, brown, Asian, and they did so very peacefully. Thanks be to God, I, I was so glad to witness that. But then at 
a crowd even larger, much, much larger, larger, passed right by on a walk that began at Atwater Park. And as they were walking up towards the intersection right there by Winkies, they all stopped and they took a knee. The line was so long with so many hundreds of people that they were literally kneeling right in front of this church. Peacefully. Peacefully. And from time to time as they were walking, I would hear, Hi, Pastor Matt! And I would see a hand from, from one of us walking in solidarity, in support, peacefully. And so there needs to be kudos to those communities where white officers walk with the protesters in peaceful ways, but elsewhere officers are now the target of violence. Jesus encourages us not to repay violence with violence. We know that not all protests have been peaceful. Violence has broken out on both sides. I'm sure many of you heard or read about that statement that the Milwaukee uh, police of Chile, uh, police chief, <laughs> Chief Morales, he was speaking out this week, you know, basically saying our officers are being crucified. There is no excuse, none whatsoever, for violence. Although, I guess in a, in a way it's not surprising, and in a way I kind of understand. I heard this week, we shouldn't just see and feel the rage. We should understand the rage, but peacefully. Dr. King was all about peaceful, nonviolent resistance, even while there was great violence being perpetrated against them in their peaceful demonstrations. I watched the service for George Floyd and I heard his brother Terrence stand up and say, I am proud of the protests, but I am not proud of the destruction. And he said, my brother was not about that. And friends, neither should we and yet we see armed people in the protests. We hear stories of pallets of bricks being laid out on the sidewalk so that they are handy to be picked up and to be thrown. You know, friends, we need to quell violence by becoming peacemakers. Quell violence by becoming peacemakers. And so we have looked at justice and injustice. We've looked at racism and hate. We've looked at violence and the call to be peacemakers, but finally, the last matter of faith that we need is hope. Hope. Bishop Desmond Tutu said, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. Light despite all of the darkness. Can we see that light? You know, the church needs to be the source of hope. And friends, I tell you that there is reason for hope, and that reason being the people of God. True people of hate are not the majority of us. As Dr. King said, it's not the hate of the bad people that is the problem, but the silence, the inaction of the good people who are called to be ambassadors of love and hope. Can we come to a deeper love? Can we be a nation of love? Friends, start with your family. Start with your friends. Stand up for what is right. Have hope. Don't wish for it, but have hope that it is possible that one day, hopefully soon, it will come to be. I have hope that we will figure this out, that we will have answers to questions like, what will it take for us to consider, for us to view our neighbors as bearers of God's image rather than as intruders or as threats? In that Christian century, I read something that I really just kind of had to walk with. It said, what will it take to begin to untangle ourselves from the demands of whiteness and live more fully in the legacy of Jesus? It can't be done overnight. It takes continual deliberate work. It takes vulnerability to do this work and openness to change of the mind and the heart and the help of the Holy Spirit. Andy Stanley is 
pastor of North Point Ministries. He's the founder in Atlanta. I, I think it's the largest church. Uh, he tweeted, I've been advised not to post about the murder of Ahmaud Arbery until I calm down a bit. But that's part of the problem, isn't it? We calm down and go on about our business. This must end. Our black brothers and sisters need white advocates to bring this to an end. And he ended that t uh, tweet with, count me in. You know, when you look at our currency, you, you see a Latin phrase, e pluribus unum, which literally means out of many, one. We are all one. Yes, diverse, but that's a diverse should, that diversity should be celebrated. Are we one? I heard a, one person say of people of color this week that they can entertain us through music, through sport, through service, but are they equal in your eyes, our collective eyes? Are they them? Or can we see them as us? And then the hard question, what are we willing to sacrifice for equality? What are you willing to do? Have you considered your white privilege? I saw a clip a couple weeks ago before all this violence came out of two friends, one white, one black, and they were in a convenience store. The white one was a shoplifter who shared with his African-American friend that he brought him with him to the store because he knew that all the store employees would be watching the black man and give no notice to the white guy who was actually robbing the store. White privilege. I know I was born with white privilege. My father never had to tell me to wear a lanyard around my neck with my driver's license and the, the title to the car in it to make sure that an officer won't assume I'm reaching for a gun if I go into the glove compartment or into my jacket. We all want the same things for ourselves and for our children. But, friends, until the people of God rise up for good, our children and our children's children will have to experience the same ugliness that we have and that we are currently experiencing. And so we had these two questions. Are we so broken, so fractured that we are beyond repair? It is my prayer that the answer is no. The second question, as people of God, what are the matters of faith that we must tend to so that healing might take place? To this, I want my prayer to be, yes, we are. Yes, we are working for justice, standing up for what is right, peacefully denouncing that which is unjust. Yes, we are working to abolish racism by focusing on equality, our sameness out of one, many. Yes, we are working to quell violence by becoming peacemakers. And as people of faith, yes, we maintain hope that the dream of equality will one day, one day be realized. And we preachers end our sermons with amen, which means may it be so, let it be. Amen. And so I invite you at home to uh, join with us as we uh, offer up the song of worship, If We Are the Body.
that praise song asked the question, if we are the body. Friends, that's not a question. We are the body of Christ, called to work together, that everyone, regardless of age, orientation, ethnicity, that they can see themselves as a beautiful child of a living God. Let us work for that. If you want to come after the 1030 service, we will be outside offering the body of the Christ and the cup of blessing for the forgiveness of sins. Have a great week. Amen.